Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Uh, welcome to today's lecture on behalf of International Students of Islamic Psychology. Uh, we're very happy and honored to be with you today. Inshallah, today's lecture is on Futua from Boys to Men, How to Utilize the Islamic Concept of Nobleness to Develop a Sound Islamic Masculinity. And today, alhamdulillah, uh, we are so honored to welcome our dear brother, Sayyid Jamaluddin Miri from Sweden. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Inshallah, we will start with our Fatiha. Um, we'll share with you a few guidelines to make our session, inshallah, run smoothly. Uh, we would like to appreciate our dear brother Jamaluddin, and then we have our lecture. Questions will be um, in the chat. So if you feel free during the session, uh, if you have any questions that are arising uh, that you'd like to uh, have answered. So we'll be collecting them, Brother Muhammad Nadal and myself, um, and we'll be asking them to our brother Jamaluddin after his uh, lecture. Uh, we also will be sharing some things in the Zoom chat, so please take a look at that um, uh, with regards to forms and ways that you can continue to participate and a closing to our inshallah. So inshallah, right now, if we can gather our intentions, and as our teachers have always said, the, the barakah comes from the from the niyas. So inshallah, we gather our hearts in this beautiful month of Rabia, and we ask Allah for his uh, affection and for his gaze of uh, inaya upon us, and that he makes us like the Prophet Sallallahu And so with all those beautiful intentions, uh, we ask for everyone to engage in the Fatiha. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنأمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين All right, inshallah. So just a few things about our Zoom etiquettes. So please do keep yourself on mute um, during the session. Uh, we'd ask that you don't make any personal recordings or screenshots. Um, as I mentioned, you can ask questions in the chat. And for we do have a live uh, transcription available. So for anyone for any reason uh, would like that, please press the more button with the three dots and you can request that. and. Uh, uh, the live transcription will be available to you. Briefly about uh, ISIP, our mission statement for anyone who's joining new or um, is uh, just familiarized with our mission. We are an inclusive space and in de designed to connect people with diverse backgrounds interested in Islamic psychology. We aim to disseminate, share resources, and discuss best practices in a free and accessible manner. And we hope, inshallah, to be a platform to enable further development of people's personal and professional interests, studies, understanding of Islamic psychology, and inshallah, to normalize this field within our communities and our countries of origin. Uh, there are a number of ways that you can continue to participate beyond this lecture. We have the ISIP YouTube channel. We hope that you can subscribe. All of our previous lectures in different languages are also available there. Today's lecture will also be recorded and be available on that uh, YouTube channel as well. Uh, we have the um, Islamic Psychology WhatsApp groups. So you're uh, welcome to join uh, those as well. And please do visit our website, um, www.icip.foundation. Uh, on there, we have some databases. We have a lot of uh, useful information. Uh, you can also access our digital library, which Alhamdulillah wa shukur Allah, uh, is collecting resources on Islamic uh, psychology, um, and it's free to become a member. And then once you become a member through the website, you can access the um, digital library. So it's my uh, pleasure and my honor to introduce uh, today our dear brother Jamal Adin. Um, as you probably know, he is the director and co-founder of ISIP, International Students of Islamic Psychology. 
Um, he's co-founder of the al Balkhi Institute of Islamic Psychology, Psychological Studies and Research, the Shifa Institute in Scandinavia, and Futua and Nasheed Academy. And we'll, he'll be sharing a little bit more about that. And he has a, a commission editor role for the books related to Islamic psychology at Beacon Books. He is also currently a guest lecturer at Islamic psychology at IOU, International Open University. He is a licensed counselor with a postgraduate degree, um, a graduate diploma, sorry, in Islamic psychology. Uh, so he was the first cohort of the Cambridge Muslim College. Um, he's also completed the level one and level two of the TIIP, traditionally in, uh, Islamically integrated psychotherapy, um, which was uh, offered in Turkey for the last couple of years through the Khalil Center and the Ibn Haldun University. Um, he's currently also enrolled in the um, uh, clinical psychology program at Lunds University in Sweden. And uh, he's a lecturer and an educator in Islamic psychology, decolonality, alternative pedagogy, grassroots organizing, interculturality, strategic communication, tarbiya, and nishid arts. And from a personal um, introduction, um, Sayyid Jamaluddin has been an inspiration to many of us. And I've been really honored to be working with him as co founder for ISIP. Alhamdulillah, wa shukr Allah. We're so honored. Brother Jamal Adin, that you are um, gracing us with your uh, time uh, today as usual, uh, gives uh, many hours to ISIP, alhamdulillah wa shukar Allah. So thank you so much. On behalf of um, everyone at ISIP, um, we really want to take this time to appreciate you as well. Um, thank you so much, Sister Fatima. Shall I start? Uh, Yes, please. All right, thank you so much. Let me share my screen. Uh, if you can stop sharing your screen, please, sister, so I can share mine. Yeah, sorry, I don't know why it's not showing. Um, my Zoom is not showing. Oh, perfect. No, I think it's working. Thank you, sister. So let me just, Bismillah, let me just share my screen. We have had some issues with the Zoom. Wash the zero apologies, brothers and sisters. Let's see here. Okay, it doesn't work right now. Let me do it again. Share my screen. All right. Slideshow. All right. Perfect. Bismillah. Well, alhamdulillah. Wa salawat wa salam ala rasulullah wa alihi wa sahbihi wa min wala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear brothers and sisters, excellent members. I want to send my sincere. Uh, gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost because without him we will not be here all the knowledge acquired by us and ISIP is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala everything that I'm presenting today is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all the mistakes are solid in mind and all the good things are from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his beloved prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam I want to thank sister Fatima as the co-founder of ISIP her, her excellent work I also want to thank brother Muhammad Nidan for his excellent work as one of our task facilitators to all the members who joined today Thank you so much, dear sisters and brothers, for joining all of your efforts, all of your resource sharing, all of your discussions, all of your passion, all of your knowledge is so important. We are a, a khidma-oriented movement, uh, and we all are doing this visibility for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and really to normalize Islamic psychology and break the stigma speaking about mental health amongst Muslim communities all over the world, and also to give an alternative to the Western psychology, which is not always as many parts of it, it's not applicable to our Islamic ontology, epistemology and paradigm to show an other avenue and actually to also bring about awareness of our beautiful tradition when it comes to ilm and nafs. We have such a rich history that we should be proud of, but unfortunately uh, for many, many, many decades, we haven't had a connection to this tradition, but thanks to our excellent scholars in the field, thanks to Professor Madik Vedri Rahimullah and all of his students, and all other excellent scholars that have the opportunity today to really revive the notion of psychology. I think somebody's microphone is on. If you could just please mute yourself, inshallah. During this session, we will share some links in the Zoom group. We're going to establish an ISIP, a Futuwa Academy and the Shad and Nasheed Academy initiative. We will have two groups to offer, one only for brothers and one both for brothers and sisters. Because Futuwa, even though I will focus on how to utilize Futuwa uh, when it comes to masculinity today, Futuwa is not only for masculinity, it's also for 
femininity, it's also for sisters as well. So we will have one group only for brothers and one group that will be mixed brothers and sisters. Uh, Brother Nida, could you mute those who are not uh, uh, muted, please, without muting me at the same time? Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, today's session will be about Futuwa from boys to men, how to utilize the Islamic concept of nobleness to develop a sound Islamic masculinity. And honestly, it's not easy to translate Futuwa as a terminology from Arabic to English. Uh, chivalry is one way to say it, but chivalry has quite a, quite a problematic uh, etymological uh, root, because it comes from chevalier, which is actually crusaders. So what actually the interesting thing, the whole knighthood and the whole crusaders so-called notion of chivalry, they, when they were doing their you know, crusades in the Middle East, and when they met Muslims, they learned from our Futuwa tradition and they took it back to West. This is something that West never wants to acknowledge, how they, a lot of the Western notions we have today of chivalry, even psychology came originally from our Islamic tradition. This is quite significant, dear brothers and sisters. So the word shivadri came from the Crusaders interaction of Muslim warriors uh, and both uh, and spiritual fighters uh, who taught by their interaction, they were taught by our conduct as Muslims, how to be a noble person and how to utilize nobleness. So this is quite interesting that we need to be mindful of history and to decolonialize a lot of the constructs that we take for granted is rooted in Western tradition, which actually comes from other traditions, including our beautiful Islamic tradition. I will focus though, how we can utilize Futuwa to develop a sound Islamic masculinity. But as I mentioned, uh, this is just, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, so the previous slide was just the introduction of myself, Sister Fatima already done that. Futuwa is not only for brothers, it can also be utilized for sisters as well. So, an introduction of the lecture today. Our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he is the Insan Kamil, the perfect man. He has the perfect balance in his soul, the Mizan, which was truly his nature. Those to follow the Sunnah is to follow the path and reflect upon the qualities of Insan Kamil. But how can we adhere to the principles of the perfect man? How can we internalize it? What does it mean to be and become a man? This is the question. So from ancient times, dear brothers and sisters, the coming of age and entering manhood has long been associated with elaborate rituals, responsibilities, and infused meaning. Currently though, in the Western secular narrative, it's a deviation that they have established from the fitly natural manhood. This model of Western ways of approaching masculinity is promoting alternative gender roles. We as Muslims though, need to go back to the prophetic manhood model embodied in the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and as mentioned in the Holy Quran. While in the West and, this, and in the secular notion, it's, it's right now a movement of dismantling the whole concept of traditional manhood. We as Muslims, on the other hand, need to reinstall the Islamic and prophetic values of sacred manhood. Dismantling manhood. In many sense, in many cases, dear brothers and sisters and our participants, we do agree with some of the criticism in West and in Western notion when it comes to the problems that are affiliated with toxic masculinity, right? Toxic masculinity could be defined as the need to aggressively compete and dominate others and encompasses the most problematic proclivities uh, in men. And Nancy, uh, Nancy Dowd is a, is a, is a scholar. She uh, wrote a book called Redefining Fatherhood, where she stated regarding the, uh, the modern crisis of manhood, the following quote. And you can find in the page 184. I will share all the references uh, in the end of the lecture as well, dear brothers and sisters. The separation of men and men's work from the family may well be the most significant personal and social disruption men have ever had to face. For generations, industrial society has been conducting an unparalleled anthropological experiment. What is the effect of virtual father absence on the family, children, and the redefinition of men's role in society? After several generations, the tragic results of this experience are being seen in the growing crisis for men and masculinity. And this is a very uh, thorough quote, uh, a very profound quote and how the absence of the father and 
male sound role model affects youths, specifically men, but also women, of course, and is one of the roots into uh, people entering so-called toxic masculine uh, spaces and toxic masculinity as, as, as a notion. And these two pictures are important pictures to allude to. A lot of you brothers and sisters who are working with youths, maybe you have children yourself, we know that amongst youths and specifically Muslim men and Muslim boys, these two pictures are significant as role models. And I say, unfortunately, on the left side, you'll see the picture of Al Pacino when he is playing the character Scarface or Tony Montana from the movie Scarface, which has affected a whole generation and generations of Muslim boys and men into how they perceive, perceive, perceive what is it to be a man, you know? And on the right side, you see a picture of a person who has a gun in their hand, and this is connected to gang-related violence. And a lot of Muslim youths and Muslim boys and Muslim men, yeah. particularly in West, are actually gravitating towards joining gangs. And these are roots to, uh, to a masculinity which is not fitri. So the link between toxic masculinity to, 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 uh, to men being raised without real models is significant. So if you don't have a solid sound male role model, easily you can go into a toxic masculinity space. Young boys without a primary masculine caregiver in the home will start to search for role models in popular culture, right? We saw Tony Montana and Scarface, the pictures in the previous slide. These uh, figures have become the new role models for a whole generation of boys and young men. Violence, phonification, and not showing emotions are some of the distorted manhood attributes that young boys are picking up from popular culture, whether it is from popular music, movies, TV series, or video games. I'm sure you see the video games we're playing today. There's a lot of violence, a lot of, you know, uh, assault. Uh, also, a lot of colonial narratives where they're uh, the freedom fighters are Richard Lionheart and the terrorists are Muslims or, you know, uh, minorities. Uh, and all these TV series, video games affect our youths, and that's where they could arrive to uh, role models. This leads to internalized gender stereotypes that both men and even women are adhering to. Boys and men are not allowed to show emotions, ill-equipped to label their emotions, and all of these things leads to emotional avoidance. And this is something we can see amongst young boys and even men, honestly, that we're not labeling our emotion. And when you're not labeling in your emotion, you're not showing your emotion and all emotions are giving from Allah. It's fitri, right? I mean, everything of our emotional states are from Allah. Now, it doesn't mean that we should live out to it in the fullest. We should balance them and moderate them. But when we are moderating our emotion, it's actually something that is profound and very much something we should express. But in this culture that we're living in, which is not a fitly culture, a lot of men are not expressing or labeling their emotion. And this leads to destructive ways of channelizing your emotions, for example, in aggressive behaviors. Emo emotional avoid avoidance leads to suppression of ihsas, emotions that God has provided to mankind. The suppression leads to less caregiving, less compassion, and less mutual interaction. And as a result, dear brothers and sisters, aggression becomes the predominant form of showing emotions. Now, fit three ways of emotional regulation. So how can we work with emotional regulation from a fit three uh, aspect and perspective? And this picture is, you know, we have our beloved prophets uh, named there, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and also the Khalifa uh, Rashidun, which are all amazing role models of how to be a Sound fitri man. There is nothing wrong with a certain amount of anger in itself. And contrary to the Christian belief of turning the other cheek, we as Muslims do believe that there is a meaning and purpose with everything that God has made as part of our human construct, including anger. And Imam Ghazali, rahimullah, he mentions in the Marvels of the Heart, why qadab, anger, is an important internal army. And he says, quote, the heart needs two armies to drive off the things that lead to destruction. A an internal army of anger, qadab, by which it drives off things that lead to destruction and takes revenge upon its enemies. 
and an external army, which is the hand and the foot by which it carries out the dictates of anger. This is completed by means of things outside the body, such as weapons and the like. Now, what Imam Ghazali is referring to and what we can learn from this statement is that we need anger. A regulated form of it is good to express as a means of, for example, self-protection and to ward off potential harms. Even using weapons could be justified as a means of protecting yourself, your family, or your deen, even though this is, of course, the last resort as self-defense, right? The problem is, in these modern days, that our youth's anger and aggressive behavior, and not only youth, honestly, even adults, right, is a pathological and distorted version of the qadab that is part of our fitra and is part of our natural disposition. So this is a distorted version of qadab, not the fitri version. And it's worthy to notice that our beloved Prophet وسلم, as the insan kamen, was in clear balance with all of his emotion as the insan kamen. He shed some tears when necessary. For instance, the loss of his son Ibrahim, he expressed sadness. He laughed with the Sahaba, so he expressed joy, right? He used his anger to fight for the haq, truth, he felt aversion, disgust towards the munafiqun, the hypocrites. He was always in a state of taqwa, God-fearing, equal to fear. And in a sense, for all of us who have studied psychology, he was the living embodiment and the balance of the five out of the six universal emotions that Paul Eichmann spoke about. Joy, sadness, fear, anger, and disgust. The sixth uh, um, universal emotion, though, which is surprise, according to Ikman, as one of the key emotion, I left that out. Because in my view, that is not applicable with our Islamic paradigm, because nothing should be of surprise for us as we believe in Qadr Allah, predestination and nasib, destiny. But the five out of six is applicable to how the Prophet وسلم, expressed his emotions. Now, survival of the fittest. What do I mean with this slide? You see a bigger fish eating a smaller fish, and the smaller fish is eating the most tiniest fish, right? So the notion of survival of the fittest, within the rise of industrialization, um, industrialization has destroyed men's friendship with each other and replaced it with competition, survival of the fittest, right? Competition, and destroyed gender complementarity. Capitalism and materialism, dear brothers and sisters, which is a byproduct of industrialism, has replaced the concept of togetherness and social cohesion with competition and social Darwinism. Survival of the fittest as a common slogan of this contemporary era is drilled upon us, right? In schools, in society, in the labor market, everywhere, even in academia, right? Who is best? Who is doing most? Who is producing most? This is the slogan that we all have internalized. We as Muslims are not against competition, right? Rather, we are instructed to compete in acquiring virtues that pleases God Almighty. And there are several verses in the Holy Quran that encourage the believers to rush towards good, as well as competing with each other to attain good. But this is a different competition than what the notion of survival of the fittest is alluding to. For example, in, 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 in this ayat from Surah Harid, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, take the lead towards forgiveness from your Lord and uh, a paradise as vast as the heavens and the earth prepared for those who have faith in Allah and his apostles. It will be there for, for you, for all of us, right? Allah is also alluding in Surah, Surah Al-Baqarah, and everyone has a direction to which he should turn to take the lead in all good works. So in goodness, we should compete, but it's not survival of the fittest. We're acknowledging each other and we just, you know, together uniting in the competition to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there is a verticality in this and also a communal level and something of a collective effort when it comes to our notions of competitiveness. But as a competitive society that does, that does not have God as its aim for the, for the competitiveness is doomed to fail. As we see in Western societies and in secular societies, uh, and also, un un unfortunately, in, in the whole world, because secularism is the norm today, unfortunately, there is no vertica verticality. There is no connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and then it's doomed to fail and leads to the destruction of gender complementarity. Here is where the secular criticism of toxic masculinity, dear brothers and sisters, differs from our Islamic point of view, which, is also, which also reflects our ontological and paradigmatic differences. While the secular critique generally wants to deconstruct the concept of masculinity as a whole and abolish it once for all, because they see masculinity as the root of all evil, right? We as Muslims should deconstruct toxic masculinity, which is a product of Western uh, imperialism in a sense, and work for a revival of Islamic, prophetic, and Sunnah-oriented masculinity. We want to revive the fitri masculinity. They want to revise masculinity with they, the secular notion, right? They want to reconstruct and develop new gender roles and identities, while we as Muslims see this as solidly in the realms of God's creative power, not in the hands of the creation itself. They want men to take women's place and women to take men's place, right? This is the notion we see in many societies today. We believe that men and women complement each other and are in mutual need of each other's presence, subhanAllah. Our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reminded us that we are part of the natural world despite our generation's deliberate attack on nature, its ecosystem, and its promotion of unnatural lifestyles, sexuality, identity, ideology, etc. Now, let me now connect to one of the main topics in this lecture as well, which is why futuwa? Why establishing a sound of fitri Islamic masculinity? Why utilizing that? So I want to shed some thoughts with regards to gang violence amongst Muslim boys and men. For a lot of you who are living in Europe, for instance, you know that unfortunately a lot of the gun violence and gang related activities are, you know, many Muslims, youths and Muslim boys and men are active in these spaces. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring them back to fitri spaces, inshallah. We need to reach out and work socially uh, in a lot of the communities to, 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 to show the youths another avenue uh, in how they could express their identity as boys and men in a more sound Islamic fitri masculine way. Now, this is an article from an uh, international newspaper uh, stating very chaotic situation, gun violence on the rise in Sweden. Rate of fatal shootings in Sweden ranks very high compared to other European countries, says Swedish National Council of Crime Prevention. So I live in Sweden, and Sweden is internationally always portrayed as this, as this peaceful country, you know, you know, perfect, you know, infrastructure. We have a great, you know, uh, welfare system and all these things. And I'm not saying that there are not good things in Sweden, but Honestly, it's all a little bit about a little bit whitewashing of uh, Sweden in, 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 in our foreign ways of uh, foreign policy way of uh, introducing our country. There's a lot of social issues here, a lot of discrimination, a lot of racism and anti-Muslim anti attitudes and Islamophobia and Afrophobia, many other uh, racist, uh, racist ideologies that are normalized. In the recent uh, parliamental election and the far right extreme uh, party, uh, got, uh, became the second biggest party, and they're very anti-Muslims, uh, Islamophobic, and also anti-migrants uh, as a whole. Uh, so there is a lot of issues in Sweden that we're facing. And gun violence is on the rise, and uh, a lot of gang, gang violence is organized in communities where there's a lot of Muslims, and particularly a lot of Muslim boys and men are gravitating towards these, uh, these uh, type of activities. Uh, so why do young Muslim boys and men choose to be involved in gangs? There is a, a theoretical framework called multiple mar uh, marginality, uh, dear brothers and sisters, which can be utilized as a tool to use to understand why Muslim youth are gravitating towards street gangs, right? As a theory building framework, multiple marginality addresses ecological, economic, social, cultural, and psychological factors that underlie street gangs and youth's participation in them. Poverty is the central reason for the rise of street gangs throughout the contemporary world, and that street gangs are the offspring of marginalization, powerlessness, destabilization, and fragmentation of people's lives could be the end result of social and economic marginalization. And a quote from a Vigil, which is a scholar who actually introduced the whole framework of multiple marginality, he says in one of his articles, 
when other societal, uh, socia societal institutions have become undermined, fragmented, privatized, outsourced, and rendered largely ineff ineffective in segregated communities and neighborhoods, then the street gangs become the institute that cater to the needs of disenfranchised youth when other institutes have failed. So the Muslim diaspora in Europe is quite different than North America. Uh, in North America, majority of Muslims, as I understand, and please forgive me if, uh, my, uh, for lack of knowledge, but this is just from, from you know, speaking with my colleagues in North America, um, majority of Muslims are middle class, you know, well-educated. Uh, while in, in Europe, a lot of Muslims are refugees coming from uh, lower social economical backgrounds. So definitely uh, poverty is very much uh, rooted, uh, economical um, uh, poverty is rooted in a lot of uh, Muslim uh, uh, neighborhoods and communities all over Europe, specifically here in Sweden, Denmark, Germany, France, etc. So it's a little bit different situation for Muslims in Europe compared to North America, uh, if we take uh, the diaspora of Muslims in, in the West. Uh, next slide. So it's worth mentioning uh, that in hier hierarchical society, some groups based upon multiple marginality become marginalized due to social, cultural, religious, and economic reason. This is certainly the case for, for example, Swedish Muslims who are affected by multiple discriminatory factors. Furthermore, when the hierarchies and societies are not based upon divine law, that's why I call this slide modern paganism, fame, money, and power. Fame, money, and power is modern paganism. You know, this is uh, this is uh, the shirk that we're doing today. We're you know idolizing and we are almost uh, submitting ourselves to fame, money, and power because that's what is the narrative and that is what um, is established in our society as how you will be a successful person is measured through fame, money, and power. Right. So this is modern paganism. So. In hierarchy, hierarchies, hi, when the hierarchies in societies, as I said, is not based upon divine law and verticality, dear brothers and sisters, which emphasizes accountability of your actions towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, social cohesion, the value of inclusion, the importance of the nuclear family, the importance of morals and ethical standards, an understanding of God's omnipotent power, and the centrality of worshiping him alone, then it's easy to go astray. Hence, modern paganism, right? The secular and capitalistic oriented societies do not judge you by your spiritual or moral, or moral resolve. Rather, you get judged by your career, right? Power, fame, money, name, recognition, fame, right? And materialistic wealth. These are the material objects of our worship. And modern day paganism is to worship actors and artists instead of statues, which was the case during the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's time. Another aspect that is, that is very important to shed some light about your brothers and sisters is the challenges of the TCKs, the third culture kids. The street gangs give you the sense of power. So it is not too far-fetched to understand why the powerless might find this avenue empowering. The gang gives you a sense of meaning, a sense of power, and a sense of belonging. For a Muslim youth raised in the West, the feeling of ruthlessness is inevitable. These are some of the challenges of being a third culture kid. What does third culture kid mean? So third culture kid meaning children and youths who are raised in a culture other than their parents, like myself, for instance, raised in Sweden, but originally um, mixed Persian, Turk, and Arab, right? Uh, uh, their parents uh, or their uh, or the culture of the country of nationality and also live in a different environment during a significant part of their child development years. Other challenges of being a TCK, a third culture kid, is developing a sense of belonging, commitment, and attachment to a culture. You're like, in, in a sense, you feel this dissonance. Am I Swedish? Am I Persian? Am I Arab? Am I German? Am I Turk? Am I French? Am I Somali? Am I Canadian? Am I Gambian? Am I American? Etc. In our case with Muslim youths, they do not understand the culture or religious practices of their families due to language barriers, right? Miscommunication. 
And at the same time, they are marginalized and discriminated by the majority society due to Islamophobia, demonization, racial profiling, structural discrimination, etc. One key factor worth mentioning is also that the dominant society's distortion and neglect of Muslim youth's religious and cultural heritage and background carries psychological effects. Unfortunately, when their culture or religion is portrayed, it is mostly portrayed in a stereotypical negative manner, which you can see with all the stereotypes that we see in popular culture, through media, about our culture, about our religion, even in history books. Honestly, if you read the psychology, the history of psychology uh, or, and the encyclopedia of psychology that Oxford usually releases, we don't see any contribution, almost any contribution from Muslim scholars into the field of psychology, even though we know that we have such a rich tradition in Islamic thought when it comes to ilm al-nafs and psychology. So when you're always portrayed in a stereotypical way, that will affect your psyche and you will internalize these notion and maybe you will subconsciously or even subconsciously become that stereotype as a, as a mean to survive, as a mean to get recognition. So what defines a gang? It's important to also know that. So gangs could be referred by using five major criteria. One, a group, more than two persons. Two, distinct from other groups, having a unique identity. Three, a degree of permanence in the group, lifetime membership in a stable constellation. Four, have specific methods of communication, for example, signs, symbols, colors, clothes, looks, code of ethics, inauguration processes, etc. And five, involvement in criminal activity. Now, going to the title from Boys to Men and Futua, right? So feeling of rootlessness, dear brothers and sisters, neglect, feeling that you're stuck in the middle. These are all psychological states, or as we in Islamic psychology, psychological terminology refer to as hal or ahwal, that is not firm and makes it easier for a person then to go astray, you know, when you don't have a firm state, uh, a feeling uh, and a psychological state of mind. Hence, joining a gang becomes an attractive alternative. Muslim youth choose the gang life as a way to get recognition. In Swedish and Western societies, seldom they give Muslims recognition beyond the negative stereotypical portrayal, which, was, which I was referring to in the previous slide. Many youth subconsciously internalize these stereotypes, becoming the menace of this, to the society that they're often depicted as, unfortunately. And add to it, dear uh, participants, uh, the lack of um, uh, male role models. And in particular, um, and then the gang becomes the entrance point from uh, boyhood into manhood, right? Due to lack of male role models and mo role models uh, as a whole. So modern boys are not initiated to manhood and the lack of male role models is evident because all caregivers around them are mainly women. If you go to the kindergarten, it's mainly women and the schools, mainly female teachers, even in the universities or in the colleges, most, most spaces where we see young boys and Muslim youths interact, most of the caregiver are mainly women. And that's, of course, nothing wrong. That's beautiful. We need caregivers that are women, but we also need caregivers that are men, right? Male role models are equally important as female role models. We need both. All the ancient religions, though, had a process of initiating a boy into manhood. This is very important. Modernity doesn't have it anymore, but all indigenous tradition, religions, and culture did have that. And I want to refer you, dear brothers and sisters, to a quote from the writing of Hadaka which was a Native American from the Sioux tribe, where he explains how integral the concept of becoming a man was amongst the Native Americans. This uh, quote is mind blowing. He says, from childhood, I was consciously trained to be a man. That was, after all, the basic thing. But after this, I was trained to be a warrior and a hunter and not to care for money or possessions, but to be in the broadest sense a public servant, subhanAllah. After arriving at a reverent sense of the pervading presence of the spirit and giver of life and a deep consciousness of the brotherhood of man, the first thing for me to accomplish was to adopt myself perfectly to natural things. In other words, to harmonize myself with nature, 
To this end, I was made to build the body both symmetrical and enduring, a house for the soul to live in, a sturdy house defying the elements. I must have faith and patience. I must learn self-control and be able to maintain silence. I must do with as little as possible and start with nothing most of the time because a true Native American always shares whatever he may possess. SubhanAllah. Let's just, just read this quote, dear brothers and sisters. He's not a Muslim, but most of the things you're saying is according to our spiritual tradition, right? So in all these indigenous cultures and tradition, there is a lot of hikmah and wisdom. And our Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that, that the wisdom is the last property of the believer. Wherever we find it, we can take it and we're the most deserving of it, right? So look at what he's saying, Hadaka here. So they had inauguration processes. You know, They send boys out in the prairies and out in the, in the forest to, to, to learn to be by themselves, to learn to, to, to hunt, to learn to, 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 to be connected to nature, uh, to feed yourself and your family. This is beautiful. And this is something we lost in modern era. Honestly, how do we know how to hunt today? You just go to the store, you know, whether you live in Sweden or Turkey or Saudi or Malaysia or Indonesia or US, you go to the store, you get a package of meat. You don't know how is this meat created? <laughs> who hunted it? Who slaughtered it? Who fixed it? Who marinated it? Who packaged it? We just buy it and we don't, we forget. We just think that this just came directly from above. No, it's been a process until you find it in the store. So we're so disconnected from our natural way of living, from our natural disposition, dear excellent brothers and sisters, that we don't have these processes anymore. We don't know how to work with our hands anymore. And when I say we, particularly people in industrialized societies, right? So let's now, uh, from Hadaka's quote, go to our sunnah as a therapeutic solution. All right? Alhamdulillah. As Muslims, we share same similar concepts, processes, and values as what Hadaka was speaking in the quote in the previous slide. We have had the arenas such as the tariqas, where initiation through bayah, allegiance, gave members a sense of belonging. But there has been an attack on these rituals, and this leaves a generation of boys without a strong sense of attachment or inclusion. Instead, Dear brothers and sisters, we can see amongst Muslim boys, particularly here in Europe, an inclination towards the rights of gangs to try and assert their masculinity. I was alluding to Scarface before, right? And I don't know if some of you know, but I'm a former hip hop artist. Uh, I left the scene many years ago now, but uh, I still have like, you know, uh, a history in the movement. I understand, uh, you know, like how, how, how these areas, you know, how these uh, platforms, how these, uh, you know, spaces work. And hip hop has a lot of beautiful things as well, even though the commercial hip hop today is very distorted. Actually, I do believe that hip hop has a connection to, to our Islamic tradition. This is another lecture that I will have for you another time. I have done some research about that. But generally, now when I'm using, uh, I used to be very, to be quite honest, your brothers and sisters, I had a lot of uh, trauma when I left, uh, you know, my former lifestyle and I became a practicing Muslim. I did Tauba and I, you know, started to go into myself, uh, you know, uh, my Jihad al-Nafs and my Mujahada al-Nafs and my Tazkid al-Nafs and, and my spiritual wayfaring and my Suluk as a Salik. Uh, and for many years, I couldn't listen to music and stuff until I actually made my, did my postgraduate diploma in uh, Islamic psychology at CMC. May Allah bless all of my teachers and all of my cohort members and colleagues in the program, all the students. They were part of my healing journey. Where honestly, the last year, I'm, I'm starting to contemplate that, yes, even though I've had a time where I was in Jahaliyyah, uh, and may Allah forgive me for all of my shortcomings, I can take some of the good things from that time, time and integrate it into what I want to work today with Islamic psychology, with Fatua and all the things we're doing and apply that. Because in hip hop, the poetry is something that youths could relate to. It's their language. And actually, I mean, we have Nasheed, we have poetry as part of our Islamic tradition as well, right? Which is also connected to Futuwa. We'll come back to that later in my presentation, inshallah. So as a former hip hop artist, I do have good insight in the world beyond our Islamic paradigm. And inshallah, now when I'm not as traumatized anymore, I healed a little bit, I can integrate that into uh, bringing um, 
another way of conveying our message into people or youths that are generally not affected by all of our initiatives, to find other ways of inter interacting with them and engaging them and including them in our spaces, right? Uh, and why many Muslim youths are gravitating towards the gang life as a way to search for identity, a sense of belonging, I do relate to that. I understand that. I also been in destructive, you know, uh, spaces previously. Um, and I do understand that. I don't judge the youths. I don't judge our Muslim, you know, boys, youths generally, and men. It's not their fault. Uh, even though we all have responsibility, of course, this is a societal thing as well, you know. Uh, and as I mentioned before, there's a lot of reasons through the uh, ideal, uh, through the theory of multiple uh, marginality that we can understand why Muslim youths are gravitating and specifically boys towards gangs, right? So we shouldn't demonize. These are our children. These are our brothers. This is our nephews, you know, we should work with them and bring them into our spaces and help them to, through a healthy inauguration process, reach sacred manhood instead, right? Because everybody needs belonging. And if you don't have that sense of belonging, if you're not going to the masjid, because as a youth raised in Sweden, maybe you don't speak proper Arabic. And if you go to a masjid where the khutbah is only Arabic, maybe you don't understand that and you don't feel home, maybe you feel alienated, maybe you didn't have any good, uh, you know, teachers who gave you the deen, or you didn't have teachers that were, you know, present in your life, maybe your parents didn't send you to Quran school, maybe um, your parents had mental health issues, you know, a lot of refugees have mental health issues, so they were not as present, there is a lot of reasons, and I'm not blaming the parents either, why we see a lot of Muslim boys and youths gravitating towards destructive, you know, spaces. And for this enfranchised youth, dear brothers and sisters, and excellent participants in this lecture today, discriminated against by society, the gang actually gives them what they are lacking, the rituals, the common language, gang signs, common clothes, which actually has its parallel in traditional Islamic lifestyle, right? Gives them a sense of belonging. It's all about belonging. We all want to belong somewhere, right? So actually, if we use the Sunnah as therapy, there could be an opportunity to give these youths the same sense of belonging and a proper route from boyhood into sacred manhood, inshallah. So the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam includes similar, similar rituals and practices, as I mentioned, referring to the street gangs, right? The bayya solidifies memberships and uh, allegiance, which you have in street gangs, right? The tariqa provides a route to worship. Most of the rituals are done with community, belonging, right? as in Jama'ah, other aspects signifying affiliation, wearing a kufi, look at me, I have a kufi. I don't see any brothers now in my screen. I see actually brother Ahmed from Turkey. You don't have any kufi today, but we still connect brother, you know? So, so I mean, in the end of the day, we're connecting through murabata, through heart to heart connection, but you know, we still have our attire, right? So a kufi, for example, sisters have hijab, right? And the, oh, mashallah, brother, I see your kufi now. Now we have the connection. <laughs> May Allah bless you, brother. Uh, brother Ahmed is a close colleague of mine. He's part of Al-Balkhi Institute as well. So, and the code of ethics, akhlaq, extolling virtues such as kindness, generosity, firmness, servitude are all embodied within the sunnah, right? And Islam is not just a package of beliefs, dear brothers and sisters, as you all know, but it's rituals. It is rituals, actions, engagement with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, engagement with mankind, mu'amala, all provide tools for the you to be inspired by and integrate to the whole self, subhanAllah. So beautiful. Now let's go back to the historical aspect of masculinity in the Islamic world, all right? This is important, dear brothers and sisters, for us to revisit. The conceptualization of masculinity and manhood has always been dependent on its context. For instance, to not cry, to be a man, man up, don't cry. I'm sure a lot of parents have said that to you. And maybe we as parents say that sometimes to our young boys as well. Allahu Alam. To not cry, to not show some particular emotions or to emphasize on certain behavior patterns is very much cultural and contextual specific, Urf, right? attitudes towards what constitutes the notion of masculinity. Historical notions tend to change, and notions are often social and cultural constructions as well. This is an important to have in mind. To understand what Islamic masculinity is, we need to try to see beyond the cultural norms of our contemporary societies. This is very important. Culture and religion have intertwined for better and worse, 
And some things that we might think is Islamic, for example, repressing crying, man up, in reality is a cultural habit that is quite contrary to the prophetic teachings. So to understand the concept of Islamic or fitri uh, masculinity, we need to start by understanding uh, what the Quran and the Sunnah tells us regarding this topic. And afterwards, we should explore how Islamic masculinity was conceptualized within the concept of futuwa. Please forgive me for using chivalry, because uh, chivalry is a problematic word. Rather use nobleness or youth ethics. How young boys were trained and educated within the practices of tahdib al-akhlaq, refinement of character, or how young boys became Caucasian braves, as an example. Now, I don't have that much time to go into all these uh, terminologies. I would love to speak more about Caucasian braves. I will briefly just refer to it in, in one of my last slides. But if we look at the Qurani concept of rijal, true men, Allah says in several ayat uh, in, in the Quran, what true me, men are defined as. For instance, in Surah Al-Ahzab, he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are rijal among the believers who honor their pledge to God. Some of them have fulfilled it by death and some are still waiting. They have not changed in the least. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Nur, rijal who are not distracted either by commerce or profit from remembering God, keeping up the prayer and paying their prescribed alms feeding a day when hearts and eyes will turn over. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Tawbah, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you should rather pray in a mosque founded from its first day on consciousness of God. In this mosque, there are men, rijal, who desire to grow in purity. God loves those who seek to purify themselves. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is stating here what a true man or true men are. So these three ayat in the Quran refers to the concept of rajul, man and rijal, men, and these ethical behaviors that is connected to al-rajul, al-kamil, a complete refined man. These ethical attributes and noble characteristics of rujala, masculinity, could be as siddiq, truthfulness, sharaf, honor, self-restraint, tenacity, inward pity, reverence, devotion, charity, consciousness, focus, resilience, purity, guardianship. And this, uh, this is derived from an article that Sheikh Yahya Ibrahim, Allah bless him, wrote back in 2019. I will share all the reference later, dear brothers and sisters. So that's what masculinity is defined. When we are reading the Quran, we see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has defined how to be a man, right? Now, what is masculinity according to the Sunnah? We already have uh, referred to that uh, in several slides previously. So Malik uh, anhu reported, uh, the messenger, messenger of Allah said, I have been sent to perfect good character. So this hadith indicates to us the importance of following the sunnah and the centrality of following and improving character. Thus, to follow in his footstep is to perfect one's character. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our beloved Prophet wasalam, was the insan kamil, the perfect man. He has the perfect balance in his soul. The mizan was truly his nature, subhanAllah. Thus, to follow the sunnah is to follow the path and reflect upon the qualities of insan kamal, the perfected man. Let us now draw upon some of the aspects and qualities of a perfect man. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated, narrated that Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the strong man is not the good wrestler, but the strong man is he who controls himself when he's angry, subhanAllah. <laughs> Imagine. Imagine if we could just, you know, disseminate this beautiful nasiha from our beloved Prophet والسلام, to youths today. So to be a man is to control your anger, according to the teachings, right? And according to the sunnah of the Prophet. Sahel bin Sa'ad as Sayyid radiallahu anhu narrated, a man passed by Allah's messenger and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam asked a man sitting beside him, what is your opinion about this passerby? He replied, this passerby is from the noble class of people. By Allah, if he should ask for a lady's hand in marriage, he ought to be given her in marriage. And if he intercedes for somebody, his intercession will be accepted. Allah's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kept quiet. And then another man passed by. And Allah's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, asked the same man, his companion again, what is your opinion about this second one? He said, oh Allah's messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
This person is one of the poor Muslims. If he should ask a lady's hand in marriage, no one will accept him. And if, if, and if he intercedes for somebody, no one will accept his intercession. And if he talks, no one will listen to his talk. Then Allah's messenger said, this poor man is better than, such, better than such a large number of the first type. For example, rich man asked to fill the earth, subhanAllah. So much great nasiha here, right, your brothers and sisters. So to be a man is not about your material gains or material assets, which is actually contrary to how Western secular notions are you know, uh, portraying manhood today and achievements today are judged by what? By your productivity when it comes to materialistic gains, right? Now, in another narr narration by Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, verily Allah does not look to your faces and your wealth, but he looks to your heart and to your deeds. So to be a man is not about your looks, but rather your heart and deeds, right? Also, Qatada radiallahu anhu reported, I said to Aisha, O mother of the believers, tell me about the character of the messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him. Aisha radiallahu anha said, have you not read the Quran? I said, of course. Aisha said, verily, the character of the Prophet of Allah was the Quran, subhanAllah. So to be a man, you need to internalize the Quran and embody all of the traits and manners that, are, that the Quran teaches us, such as kindness, repel evil with good, integrity, purity, hospitality to strangers, enjoying good and forbid evil, courage, patience, and steadfast. Abu Huraira, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated, narrated that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, what an excellent man is Abu Bakr. What an excellent man is Omar. What an excellent man is Abu Ubaidah bin Al-Jarrah. What an excellent man is Usaid bin Hudayr. What an excellent man is Thabit bin Qais bin Shamas. What an excellent man is Mu'ad bin Jabal. And what an excellent man is Mu'ad bin Amr bin Al-Jamu. So these are examples that the Prophet said all these sahabas are excellent men. So why? So what are the character traits that made these particular companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam excel as men according to the Prophet? So Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, as we know, was known for his generosity and kind heartedness. Umar, Umar radiallahu anhu was known for his strength and straightforwardness. Abu Ubaidah was known for his modesty. Usaid for his truth, for, uh, truth uh, trustworthiness. These are all traits of excellency according to our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what does Futuwa say? What is the concept of Futuwa nobleness? So what you said in the previous, what you saw in the previous slide is a helmet from an Ottoman uh, warrior as example of what Futuwa could constitute. Because to be a warrior is not to be a physical warrior on, only. It's a spiritual uh, warriorship as well, right? So morality and ethical issues such as noble virtues have always been important concepts in Islamic culture, as we've seen in our tradition, in our sunnah, in our in, in, in Quran, in the primary sources of Islam. Futuwa as a genre on youth ethics emerged a thousand years ago and spread around the Muslim world as a response to a need for Islamic youth ethics. The concept of Futuwa has been defined as the aggregate of all those virtues which distinguish the chivalrous young man once again, please forgive me for the word chivalrous, the word chivalrous, especially for manners and generosity. Futuba can also be seen as the practical ethics and the morality embodied in the lives, practices, and teachings of all the Anbiya, the prophets, as a way to establish a holistic personality, muruwa, and the highest level of morality, makaram al-akhlaq. Futuba guilds. So during the Ottoman period, the Futuwa Association was spread in all parts of the empire. These associations function as a guild, an organization of people for mutual aid or the pursuit of a common goal. The common goal was to create a platform for fostering generous, hospitable, upright, and heroic young Muslims through different ritualistic procedures. These young Muslims affiliated to the Futuwa Associations or guilds uh, and when they went through the procedures, afterwards they were called a feta, a young man. The Futuwa Association was also connected to the concept of uh, uh, achiyat, brotherhood. So usage of feta, young man, or achi, brother, was both equally common to address those who belonged to a Futuwa. 
And actually, it's quite interesting. Ibn Battuta, uh, Rahimullah, Ibn Battuta, Rahimullah, uh, you, I, I think most of you know Ibn Battuta, the famous traveler, the famous Muslim traveler, right? When he was traveling all over the Muslim world, he was staying in different futuas all over the Muslim world. So there's a lot of narrations from Ibn Battuta's uh, diaries where he's speaking about the futuas, the, hospita uh, the hospitality that the futuas offered to travelers and musafirs. So it's very interesting, actually, that we can see a lot of the Futuwa's work through his diary as well. So when Muslims were traveling, they always had a space to be and a place to, to, to connect with others in that local region. Futuwa as a holistic education center. So the Futuwa Association also served as an institution and an institute for training and teaching, hence guild, right? The purpose of the training and teaching was to perfect the young man, preparing them for adulthood, raising young people who fit their surroundings and respect each other's rights and to enable to fatas to obtain a profession. So it's a guild, right? The moral and ethics of the Futuwa institution was an integral part of the education. So it was both physical education, professional education, labor education, but first and foremost, everything was connected to verticality, hence spiritual education as well. There was a requirement to both abstain, takhliya, and to acquire, takhliya, abstain from gossip, slander, and evil, and prohibited acts, and to acquire humility, unselfishness, generosity, mercy, and forgiveness. What is the traits of Futuwa? The character traits that were associated with a fata or an ahi were virtue, brotherhood, bravery, honesty, temperance, rationalism, rationalism productivity, self-sacrifice, and maturity. The importance of servitude as well, and not to consider yourself superior than others, to dedicate yourself to serve the ummah, assisting the musafir, travelers, and the poor without expecting something back was also emphasized. Here we have the initiation processes and the ceremonies of the futuwa uh, consisted of both symbolic rituals, for instance, putting on a belt, and practical rituals, getting permission to serve. So you have inauguration rituals as well. The achis and fatas of the futuas also had a certain dress code. Their outfits consisted of a long white robe, boots, a belt with a sword, and a white cap called kalansuwa. So you see, in the street gangs, you have the codes of ethic and you know, and the the clothing you know style and you know particular you know domain of languages and slang. They had similar things also in the futuwa. Uh, associations and in the inauguration processes, but these were healthy, fitly ways of inaugurating boys into sacred manhood. There were also different Akhis and Fatas. Aqid was a knight or a hero, Kavli, preacher, Safi, soldier, Akhi, brother, and a sheikh. So you have different roles, which you can also see in street gangs, by the way, subhanAllah. See the resemblance with the modern street gangs. And this is something we can think about and we can marinate and we can reflect upon and contemplate your brothers and sisters and how we then can actually utilize Futuwa to bring these young boys and youths into something healthy instead and Islamic oriented. Abd al-Rahman al-Sulami is considered to be the first scholar to write the book about the concept of Futuwa. Uh, Shihab al-Din Omar al-Sohrawadi wrote the first Persian manuscript in Futuwa called Futuwa Nameh, Jawan Mardi. Their works on Futuwa represent excellent examples of how different authors of Futuwa literature use various techniques on communication and communicate their ideas pedagogically to the young generation. This could be illustrated by how al sahrawadi for example, mentions 25 virtues that all masters and members, uh, that all masters and members of Futuwa, Sahib al-Futuwa, possess using the letters F, T, and W within the word Futuwa. So virtues that he uh, established, which begins with the letter fa, <laughs> could be virtue, fadl, <laughs> fadl spiritual disclosure, futu, eloquent language, fasaha, freedom from concern and desire, faraqa, understanding, fah, discernment, firasa, practice, fiel. So that was virtues beginning with uh, fa, then virtues that begins with the letter ta, depending only on Allah, tawakkul, repentance, tawbah, Humility, tawaddu, sincerity, tasdiq, imagining, tasawwur, endurance, tahammul, voluntary service to people, tatawu, reciting praise at night, tahajjud, tender attitude, tal uh, talatuf, blessing from Allah, tabarak, 
possess the power to put things in practice, tasarruf, commitment, tam tamkin, contemplation, tafakkur, peacefulness, taskin, and then virtues that begins with the letter wow, keeping promise, wafa, piti, wara, friendship with Allah, walaya, connection to Allah, wasallah. So you see, they used poetry to disseminate knowledge and inviting the youth to understand the concept of futua, right? So as a former hip hop artist, we can use hip hop today, but in a nasheed and fitri way, right? Take away those things that are not applicable to Islamic paradigm and communicate the message of futua and fitri masculinity to our young boys, Muslim boys today, inshallah. So they did that with tools that youths related to back in the days, and we can do the same thing in this modern era. Because poetry is a strong way of communicating deep and contemplative uh, messages. So the features of Futua ethics. Dr. Shemtur, one of the leading scholars in Islamic thought from Turkey and also one of the leading scholars in Futua, he explains the Futua ethics features as, one, keep the theory implicit. It should be very implicit when you do ethics connected to Futua. Employ narrative reasoning using the stories of the Anbiya, the stories of the Sahaba. We can also use stories of, for instance, Malcolm X, you know, like more modern, you know, Muslim role models today, or you can, you can speak about Khabib Nur Muhammadov, right? I mean, there is a situation, you remember the last fight, all of you who follow UFC, uh, which is like mixed martial arts for all of you who don't know, Khabib is from, uh, from Dagestan, uh, so the Caucasian brave could be connected to his way of being. And this is a tradition that is connected to uh, the historical way of how young Caucasian boys became men. Uh, and, and if you read the story of Imam Shamil, uh, Rahimullah, one of the freedom fighters from, uh, from, from our uh, Muslim tradition and history, you can see that uh, when they spoke about manhood to boys, they used narrative reason. So they used the stories of the uh, Anbiya, the stories of the Sahaba. And we can also add Khabib today, for instance. A lot of youths, they look up to him. So when Khabib did his last fight and he won, he became the strongest man in the world, right? In mixed martial arts. What did he do? He started to cry. He started to cry. SubhanAllah. Because he lost his father three, four weeks before the fight. And he was not crying in an exaggerated way, but he was shedding some light, uh, some tears. And feeling the sadness of not having his father beside him. Similar to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he shed some tears after his son Ibrahim uh, passed away, right? So th this is something we can tell the youths through narrative reasoning that, you know, the strongest man in the world, he also shed some uh, tears sometimes. And you can also do that if you feel sadness. And as we know, psychologically and biologically, tears is a way to actually relieve your uh, energy that is encapsulated in your body. This is true. So we can help youths so that instead of uh, rele releasing, uh, you know, maybe sadness in a destructive way, they can release it in a more healthy way. Then he says, ground norms in the Quran and the Sunnah always connect all the norms into our primary sources, utilize the power of presidents, integrate concrete role models, like our beloved Prophet wasallam, or like Khabib, for instance, I mentioned him. Include the pre-Islamic narratives as well, codifies norms for easy dissemination and uses symbols for them, like using acronyms to make it easy for you to understand what Futuwa means, for instance. So application of Futuwa in our contemporary era, how can we take all this sacred knowledge, all this traditional knowledge and apply it in our contemporary era? Dear excellent brothers and sisters, whether we are parents, whether we are fathers or, brother, or, or mothers, whether we are brothers or sisters, whether we are uh, children educators or psychologists or social workers or scholars, whatever, imams, alim, alimas, how can we utilize this? All the different concepts and intervention from our Sunnah and Futuwa could be used as a means to solidify a stable process where young boys can turn to strong, compassionate, and mature men. Concepts that could replace the things that incline young boys and men towards joining street gangs and accumulating. Sorry, I think you lost me. So let me reiterate, inshallah. Uh, all the different concepts and intervention from our Sunnah and Futuwa could be used as a means to solidify a stable process where young boys can turn to strong, compassionate, and uh, mature men. Concepts that could replace the things that incline young boys and men towards joining street gangs and accumulating a toxic notion of masculinity could include Futuwa, Tauba, Husnuddan, husnu positive thinking, etc. 
One main factor that leads Muslim youth to gang affiliation is a sense of belonging. The feeling of ruthlessness common in TCK's third culture kids is evident, as we were alluding to earlier in the presentation. From a systematic family lens, the family is facing the stress to survive, and the usual support system that were a part of the family have been eliminated. Other family members, ease of communication in native language, etc. This is connected to the diaspora, people that are migrants, right? You don't have the same a sense of belonging anymore. You don't have the same connection to the community. You don't have your family uh, in your surroundings. You don't speak the native language of that country. There's a lot of language barriers, etc. So sense of meaning and purpose is being created within the gang instead for a lot of young Muslim boys and men. The safety that the gang provides mimics concepts such as loyalty, the code of ethics, rituals, symbols, clothing, and a degree of permanence with a group. These criteria addresses a lot of the psychological malnourishment that Muslim youths, particularly in West, are facing. Loneliness and lack of sense of identity are, are then met in the gang connection as a way to fulfill these psychological needs. Finding difficulties in different spheres of life in communicating and lack of stability as prevalent amongst TCKs is addressed through the gang life affiliation. And new methods of communication characterized through symbols and inaugurations gives a sense of agency, leadership, and empowerment. Now, all that a gang provides can also be found, dear brothers and sisters, in our sunnah and in futuwa, right? So similarly, the clothing that creates the sense of affiliation in the gang has its counterpart in the sunnah and in the concept of Futuwa addressed earlier, which also encouraged manliness and dressing like that of the Fatahs, young men. Modern boys are not initiated to manhood and the lack of male role models is evident. This is something we were alluding to earlier. The absence of fathers and the assertion of why gangs are replacing families has created a crisis for men's identity and masculinity. The absence of fathers and male role models in the nuclear family could be one of the contributing factors to gang life inclination. So reviving the concept of Futuwa creates that avenue to foster positive Islamic masculinity rooted in generosity, truthfulness, and steadfastness, and can, and can guide the young boy into a fatah, becoming a young man, subhanAllah. Muslim youth's insecurity could be addressed by speaking about nobleness and its components, to be in relationship with oneself, first and foremost, right? Accepting testers of life and bala and tribulations, being in relationship with others, holding the self, not others, accountable, right? Jihad al-nafs, taskiyat al-nafs, and being in relationship with God, abandon, abandoning means and ends and relying on him through the heart's reception, the qalb. Instead of being a destructive warrior represented in the gang life, causing harm in society, one becomes a spiritual warrior and, and engage in mujahada al-nafs, fighting the self. Not fighting others, fighting the self. So that empowerment that comes through det uh, detrimental means will be turned and redirected to noble endeavors. A fata rages in two wars, dear brothers and sisters. One, he is an outward warrior, where his outward war is defined by service to others. That's your fight. And his inward fight is against the lower self. Nafsalamara bin Suq. The gangster is limited to only one type of war, completely neglectful or unaware of the lower self, Nafsalamara, and its desires and becomes ruled by them. Fast money, fast cars, women, uh, all these things that are, you know, the attributes of a gangster lifestyle today, right? It is also in its place to revive the holistic aspect of education within the Islamic tradition and within the concept of Futuwa. The education and its purpose was to combine teaching with training, theory with practice, right? Training to refine the young man and preparation to adulthood. The problem in a lot of our educational centers today, uh, in the whole world actually, is that we're only working with one domain, which is theory often, not how to apply the theory. In the Fatua guilds, they were applying the theory to practice. So they combined both. And that's an easier way to embody the knowledge that you learn. So we need to go back to uh, connect the theory with practice as a practice as something integrated, not segregated. This required morals and ethics and referred to tarbiyah and tahtib al-akhlaq. 
building virtues such as the ability to abstain and self-restrain oneself and showing mercy and forgiveness towards others, for example. So many Fitri societies have recognized the importance of marking the transition of one milestone period to another, as we saw in the case of Hadaka, the, 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 the Native American from the Sioux tribe. This symbolizes responsibilities and the recognition of society and celebration and endows the young man with an outlook that bears pride and at the same time duty towards others. The Futua Association had rituals, inaugurations, or celebration to mark manhood. There were ceremonial dress, as we spoke about previously, with some responsibilities to serve. And these inaugurations offered training, not just marking a physical or biological change in a boy, but also from a spiritual vantage point, impressing upon the young man on the meanings of true fitri masculinity. So summary, dear brothers and sisters, while some of our counterparts in the West particularly want to eradicate masculinity as a means to address toxic masculinity and gang violence, we as Muslims and believers of a holistic approach to healing and well-being should rather emphasize engaging in more masculinity as an antidote towards toxic masculinity. So instead of less masculinity, more masculinity, but fitri masculinity. Masculinity here means a fitri and Islamic masculinity based upon the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as seen in our sacred tradition of manhood witness within the Futuwa. It is the toxic masculinity of the secular West, no matter which part of the spectrum, that is the root problem in many ways. Now, we cannot only blame West because we have also internalized these notions in many Muslim cultures and also many uh, majority Muslim countries, but nevertheless, that's connected to a non-fitri, non-divine, uh, non, uh, or non-vertical uh, way of uh, dealing with these issues. The toxic masculinity has been internalized by our youths, and there is no actual inauguration process that builds the bridge from boyhood to sacred manhood. What indigenous cultures and religions had as part of the processes of becoming a man is something that is lacking in the modern industrialized society. So rather speaking about Western society or secular, we can also just use modernity as the root issue for a lot of our problems today. today. Street gangs are filling the gaps and offering the sense of self-efficacy, cohesion, maturity, independence, and manhood, though in a destructive and distorted manner that the rest of the society is lacking in providing. To use Futuwa and our Sunnah as therapeutic means could break this vicious circle of gang-related violence amongst Muslim youths by re-establishing a firm maqam station in Tasawwuf and Malakat station in Akhlaq tra the tradition of Islamic masculinity and sacred manhood and give our young Muslims youth a better pathway from boyhood to manhood. Now, this is my final slide, dear brothers and sisters. Please forgive me for a long lecture. Please forgive me for any shortcomings for my presentation. As I always say, I'm a person with all the errors in my character. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. And all the good comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all the mistakes are solid in mind. If I said anything wrong, uh, conveyed any message in a wrong way, please forgive me. Uh, and, and, and all the good is from Allah. It was such an honor to present this work to all of you. So ISIP, the International Student of Islamic Psychology, we're happy to announce that we will establish a Futuwa and Nasheed Academy of Islamic Excellency and Arts. Um, so we are now uh, creating two WhatsApp groups. Uh, I think Sister Fatima or Brother Nidal has shared the WhatsApp groups in the Zoom chat. Uh, if you can share them again right now, Sister Fatima, Sister Bro uh, Brother uh, Nidal, I would really appreciate it. Um, here we will discuss how to move forward. One of the groups are only for brothers. Even though Futua is both for brothers and sisters, we need a space for brothers to speak about fitri masculinity. And I say people, we already have sister groups. We don't have brother groups. So this will be our brother groups, inshallah. So one of the groups only for brothers to join, uh, but the other group is for general information. So it's open for both brothers and sisters because then we can speak about tarbiyah, we can speak about children's education connected to Futuwa. And as uh, Dr. Shentruk also mentions and many other scholars, Futuwa is not only for men, it's also for women, it's about noble character traits. So all sisters and brothers feel free to join the general group. We will also email out these WhatsApp groups to, to all of you who registered for the lecture today together with the recording of the lecture. We will also share the groups in all of uh, ISIP's WhatsApp groups, inshallah, and social media platforms, also on our website. So if you haven't registered to the lecture, dear brothers and sisters, if Sister Fatima, if uh, Brother Nida, you can share the registration link for the lecture so that they can also receive it through email, inshallah. So 
We're going to work in the Futua Nashid Academy to find ways of applying Futua in clinical practice and social settings. And uh, we will establish Futua and Tarbiya retreats. I've been speaking with one of my great colleagues, Sister Hasna, uh, and we're planning to do some form of Tarbiya program connected to Futua, both for young boys and girls. So this will be for, for and, and different age categories as well. So this is something that we will inshallah establish and we will probably do this in Morocco. So we will invite people to join. We will do retreats uh, all over the world. I spoke with one sister from uh, Zahara Foundation in the south of Spain about doing Futuwa retreats there. Uh, and we have spoken with many of the leading scholars and practitioners and people that are active in Sunnah disciplines uh, about how we can work with Sunnah disciplines and with Akhlaq and with Futuwa and doing retreats for young boys. And of course, also young girls as well in the future. We will also establish halakas where we can read manuscripts from tra traditional Futuwa literature and youth ethics literature, uh, and more lectures to become. So this was just a preliminary lecture from my side. I have more material, so I will do a part two of this lecture, more about how to apply Futua in clinical practice and also in, in, in breaking you know, uh, gang violence or other you know, uh, toxic uh, you know, um, context where a lot of youths are you know, engaging in today, uh, and also to speak more about theoretical frameworks of Futua. So this was just a brief introduction. So this is some of the references that I have used. So, you know, this is from a lot of different sources. So just going through them. So you know that I'm not, I'm not the one who have created all this material. So it comes from a lot of sources. And I'm also writing an article that will be released soon, inshallah. Uh, hopefully it's under uh, peer review right now, uh, where you can find a lot of the uh, lecture material in that article that I've been writing as well. Uh, inshallah, it was part of my, um, uh, part of my, uh, it's also part of my passion in doing clinical application of all the knowledge that we have studied in Islamic psychology throughout, for instance, our program at CMC. So this paper will be uh, released soon, inshallah. Uh, and that's it, dear brothers and sisters. So thank you so much for listening. And uh, I'm very open for all of your questions now. And once more, thank you for taking your time. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khairan, alhamdulillah, wa shukur Allah, dear Sayyid Jamaluddin, alhamdulillah, we've really, really uh, benefited from your uh, presentation today, alhamdulillah, that um, I think there were some key points that I really felt inspired with, I really enjoyed that, uh, where you shared that fatua with the fa and the ta and the wow. And I was envisioning, oh, we need to make an infographic for this. So hopefully we'll tap some of our ISIP members to, to help do something like that. So barakallahu fikum, I really um, appreciate it. Alhamdulillah, I think in your talk, um, uh, that third culture kid, uh, I think many of us um, who perhaps are, are growing up in different areas, uh, myself included, uh, continually, um, you know, are trying to think of you know who we are and bringing that sense of identity, um, and it, we'll see some of the questions that have come up. Uh, people are raising that as well. So barakallahu fikum, takbir and Allahu akbar, and alhamdulillah. Thank you so much for 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 all of your efforts in putting this together. I, we can see that it's uh, taken a lot of research, and uh, as always, we're we're very blessed and uh, happy uh, to have you share with us. So um, we are brothers and sisters uh, coming to the uh, 90 minute mark. So, but we know that questions have come up. And so we hope that uh, if you can stay on for the questions, that is wonderful. We know that uh, Brother Jamaluddin is generous with his time. And so I know that um, we can start with some of the questions and we'll see um, how far we can get. So um, the first question is from Brother Amin. Sorry, I'm just going to close this. Okay, and he says, it seems to me as if we can turn an insolent, aggressive, and disobedient child to a docile, obedient, and a well-mannered one. So what physical part of the child do we need to change to make that, uh, to make that turn uh, materialize? And if we can turn a disobedient and a an insolent child to an obedient and well-mannered one. What was Allah's wisdom behind letting Khidr alayhi salam killing an innocent soul, Nafsun Zakiya, while he was with uh, Musa alayhi salam? 
So why was the innocent child not changed or transformed to a better human being, but killed? So it's just to refer to the question, and it's a very big question, and I think that yeah. I'll just answer it very briefly. Thank you for the question. Um, how to work with youths physically? I mean, we have our Sunnah disciplines, which is actually very fitraic in that sense, right? It's about moving yourself, you know, it's about uh, working with all domains of your body, all your limbs. And also, there is always a spiritual component to all of our physical practice. So, for mm -hmm. instance, if you're working with archery, and actually this summer when I was doing my summer intensive uh, at the CMC, we were working with archery with one great ustad jihad. He was doing uh, the reading of the sira while we were working with archery. So actually what we need to do when we work with physical training with our children uh, or with youths, uh, we need to connect it to uh, the theoretical knowledge as well and spiritual knowledge. So for instance, look at the arrow, uh, the bow. You're, you're, you're putting the bow and then you're releasing the, the arrow, right? It's kind of like working with your naps. So you can think about it like that when you're working with children, you know? And when you're doing Tasket al nafs right? Or when you do Riyadat al nafs disciplining your, you know, your lower self, you know, and, you know, elevating your nafs to nafs al matmaina the serene soul, the serene self. So you need to pull, you pull your nafs, you're fighting it, you're fighting nafs al -Mara. And it's always a pull and push because, you know, nafs al will always come there with its wet swas because shaitan uses that, that state, that, 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 that level of the nafs, you know, with all the wet swas, right? So you're putting it, push and pull, push and pull, push and pull. But if you're firm, in your physical practice and connected to a spiritual practice, then you will succeed in pulling and directing the arrow to the target, which is nafs al mutmaina. But if you're not firm in your struggle, and if you think that the struggle is easy and it's not fluctuating, because you know we're fluctuating in our inner struggles all the time. We're not always in one maqam or in one hal, in one state or in one station. We fluctuate all the time. This is part of the human trajectory. So that's something we need to speak to our children, that it's not easy way, easy way to work with refining your character or, you know, with disciplining yourself. It goes back and forward all the time. We believe in this, you know, success way of living where it's one, one way uh, streak and uh, we always have this flashy successful stories that we're watching on, you know, popular culture and media where, you know, to, in order to be successful, then it's very easy. But in our way of looking at success, which is to, to, to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's both a spiritual and a physical component to it. It's about always being in, 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 in this constant struggle with yourself, with your lower self. And you can see that by using the bow and the arrow and connecting that to disciplining yourself and working with your nafs. And by actually being able to both pull and push and to always be flexible and dynamic in that, you can actually... Uh, then um, then release the uh, arrow and you will hit the target. And the target uh, could be to hunt down the animal if you want to eat, <laughs> or the target could be to elevate your nafs from nafs al to nafs al and beyond. So sure. there's a lot of ways to tackle the question, but this is one way that I'm looking at the question of how we can engage physical practice with our children in a creative and theoretical way as well, and pedagogical okay. way. Allah Allah. Allah. I really love that, um, you know, bringing in those, those, the sunnah, if we look at archery, as you said, and bringing in those kinds of applications where you can be speaking to them about how you need to, you know, be thinking about your nafs at these moments. And even if you think about like swimming, which is, you know, the three sunnah arts is like the swimming and the archery and the horseback riding. So in horseback riding, again, you have something like you can't always control, you know, the horse or in swimming, like what you need to do so you don't drown. And sometimes you need to take your breath. And so I really love that. That was really like, a, I really love the, you know, the integrative aspect of of when we are physically at well number one even to engage our children in physical exercises so even that reminder is like so important so i mean obesity amongst muslim youths are very high yeah and actually there's a lot of research in uk also in us where you know muslim youths and muslim population generally have a higher level of diabetes compared to the general population That's and this right. is because of uh, i think lack of knowledge honestly so as one of the models we want to work, and also in the Shifa Institute that we're establishing in Scandinavia, we're speaking about this, 
how can a dietitian work with the, uh, a, a general practitioner and a psychologist, that we integrate all these professions in order to establish Futua, because Futua is also about healthy lifestyle, you know, right. eating healthy, right. consuming healthy. Halal is not, any yani, what we see as halal today is not fully halal. I mean, it's halal from a fiqh aspect, but is it halal from a holistic right. aspect? Yeah. Are we treating the animal fully correctly? Is it tayyib in a sense? So we need to look at everything in all Islamic disciplines from a holistic perspective. This is very important. Sure. All right. Um, the second and third questions are kind of related. Um, and I think you'll be able to. Uh, so Brother Ibrahim and uh, Sayyid Farzan, I'll kind of um, I'll ask the two questions kind of together because they're kind of related. So many Swedes see second gener uh, generation refugees as foreigners, even though they are born here. They go with their parents to their parents' homeland and there they are considered too Swedish. So in Sweden, they are not fully accepted and in their parents' homeland, they're not fully accepted. So what identity shall they have? And kind of, again, connected to that is that you can tell your children to be the best and to have good character. But what happens when those kids and those uh, but when kids and teachers in Sweden bully them due to their culture. So maybe the um, first Thank one. You, Who's the, uh, who who asked, uh, asked the question? So Brother Ibrahim, I believe he. Inshallah, Inshallah, Brother yeah. Ibrahim. Thank you, Brother Ibrahim. And also the second question. Was Sayyid Farzan. Sayyid Farzan. Thank you, Brother Ibrahim, Sayyid Farzan. And the, the previous question, who was it who asked the question? I just want to Brother thank Amir. you. Brother Amir. Thank you so much for your excellent questions. Um, so. What, could you just reiterate the last part of the question again, Sister Fatima? Sure. Um, so basically, again, like they're not accepted in Swedish culture, but also when you go, you know, in your homeland culture, you're not fully accepted yeah. there. So what yeah. identity shall they have? So this is a very important question. And this has nothing to, this is not only relevant for Swedish Muslims, it's also relevant for all people in diaspora, you know, so it's beyond one country. Our identity is Islam. We're Muslims. And Islam is universal, right? So before we even, I mean, the whole national state is a social construction. It's not a fitri thing. Like Allah didn't create all these, uh, you know, national borders and stuff. I mean, if you look at the map of African countries, it was like colonial rulers who had like divided Africa into different, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, countries that administrated and colonized uh, these countries. So look at Egypt. It's like a square. That's not the natural, you know, boundaries of, you know, Egypt. And, you know, we as Muslims, we believe in Ummah. And Ummah is beyond nationality borders. So you can be part of the Ummah being Sweden, and you can be part of the Ummah being in Kerala, India. So, so we need to first and foremost re, restructure our thoughts and perhaps resettle ourselves and understand how modern subjectivity has influenced our way of looking at life, looking at identities, and uh, to stop speaking so much about national identities, even though, I mean, even I do it, so I can't be the first one to admit that even I do it, but that's not the aim, because uh, culture is beautiful, and diversity is part of Islamic uh, history. I mean, look at our uh, clothing. Um, the kufi from Nigeria is quite different in its looks compared with the kufi from Saudi Arabia. So, uh, you know, uh, or the kufi from Turkey. So, in a sense, uh, within uh, Islam, we have multiplexity, which is that uh, we are all rooted in Tawheed and in our primary sources, that is the common thing, but why do we have four madahib in the Sunni Islam? <laughs> you know, so you could actually uh, interpret different, you know, notions in fiqh uh, differently according to whether you're Shafi or a Hanbali or a Hanafi or a Maliki, right? And this multiplexity should be connected to culture as well. What is Islamic culture? It's actually both a top-down approach and an indigenous approach. Top-down is that, for instance, uh, if you look at the architecture of Islamic, uh, you know, um, Islamic uh, houses or buildings or masjids or masajids, I mean, the Persian masjids are quite different and it looks compared to the masjids in Mali, right? And this is because uh, when Islam was spread, uh, our, 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 you know, we integrated with the local customs and those things that were applicable to the Islamic paradigm was integrated into the society, hence different architecture. Connect this to identity. We need to speak about the Islamic identity as 
solid when it comes to its primary sources. It should be rooted in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That is the stable ground, but then multiplex in its uh, outreach when it comes to the way it, it could be communicated through your clothes, through your language, through your culture identity, right? I mean, I am raised in Sweden. I'm quite Swedish, even though I don't look like a typical Swede, right? Because as uh, Brother Ibrahim or Sayyid Farzan was alluding to, if I go to, for instance, <coughs> if I go to my native country or my parents' native country, I should say, then they will call me Sraidi, you know, for sure. And this is the common thing for a lot of third culture kids uh, living in the diaspora, right? Now, what we should do is to not accept any of it. We're Muslims, first and foremost. And we can both be Swedish and Persian and Arab and Turk, and we can integrate all these beautiful cultures into our identity. But it should be rooted in a stable foundation, which is Tawheed and the Sunnah and the Quran. Yeah. So when our traditional scholars, like Imam Ghazali, rahimullah, for instance, uh, a lot of the works that I'm referring to came from him, or even Miskawi, or Al-Razi, or Al-Iji, or uh, all of our leading akhlaq uh, scholars, al-Sulami, uh, al al-Suhrawardi, etc. They were all engaging in other traditions as well, but they were rooted first and foremost in the primary sources of Islam, in the Quran and the Sunnah. They were strong in their Tawheed, right? And when you're strong in your foundation, when you're not rootless, like we feel in, in the diaspora today, then it's easy to actually be curious on other tradition because you know that you can explore like a child who has a, a secure attachment, right? You can easily secure, knowing that your secure base is always there, which is the primary sources of Islam and Tawheed, of course, first and foremost, Tawheed. So they actually read, you know, uh, you know, knowledge from other traditions and other cultures, and they filtered out some things that had not to do with Islamic paradigm, and they used some things that could be applicable to our paradigm. Hence, we have, for instance, in Islamic history, Yunani Tib, uh, the Greek uh, Muslim medicine, which was, kind of like some aspect of Greek medicine that was Islamicized in a sense, right? So, uh, so what I'm trying to say when it comes to identity, let us speak about hybrid identity, right? We're hybrids. We are not one or another, we're multiplex, you know? <laughs> and we're hybrids. And we speak about hybrid today, we think about cars, hybrid cars, which is run by both gasoline and, 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 and electricity, right? But we as Muslims are also hybrid in our culture. You know, there is nothing static in culture and urf. Like Persian culture is a mix of Arabic culture, Turkish culture, so many ethnic, you know, influences. The same goes with Indian culture. The same goes with Swedish culture. The same goes with all cultures all around the world. And when we start to speak about this and not to speak about ethnicity or identity as something that should be in a certain way, then I think that children and youths will feel less rootless and more encouraged and they're third culture kid identity, because it's a strength to be third culture kid. You have connection to so many cultures, which will enrich in you, right? But the problem for the third culture kid and why they go astray, including myself historically, is because they're not rooted in a stable foundation. And when you're not rooted in a stable foundation, which you, when you're a rootless person, when you feel rootless, then you can easily go astray. That's the problem. But if we put the root there, the stable foundation, which is what? Tawheed and the Quran and the Sunnah, then we have a stable foundation, which is our main identity. And then from there, we can actually be multiplex as well. We can be curious as well. And then it's actually just richness to be Indian and Swedish or Turk and German or uh, Pakistani and Canadian, etc. And this is the beauty of what our civilization uh, was established upon. And we can see it in our culture and in our traditions as well. So that's my take on it. And we need to root our youths, whether they're Swedish or foreigners, or whatever, into their own history, our Islamic history, our Islamic values, Futua, and then they can get the sense of belonging and proud of our history. And then you're nurturing their roots. You're giving water to the roots. What will happen with a tree if you don't water the tree? You will not be able to eat the pomegranates that are coming down as fruits from the tree. I love pomegranate. That's why I said pomegranate. Too. Maybe you love <laughs> apples or maybe you love mangoes. If you're from Kerala, the, you like coconuts, perhaps. Whatever. What I'm saying is that we are like trees. And I love the olive tree, all right? Because this is a symbol of our Palestinian brothers and sisters' resistance. May Allah make it easy for all of our Palestinian I mean. brothers and sisters. So in the olive, 
if you have olive tree, you have uh, the tree has its roots. If it doesn't get water, what happened? The tree will die. You will not receive any olive uh, fruits, right? We as human beings are like trees. We have our roots in the, in the earth. If we don't get water, then we will not have fruits. What is the water for us? Connection to our history, connection to our primary sources, Quran and Sunnah, connection to our tradition and our uh, divine disciplines, connection to our culture. And then you suddenly, instead of thinking, oh, I'm only a gangster as a Muslim or I'm only a terrorist as a Muslim. Wow, I was a psychologist as a Muslim. We were the first who uh, established psychiatric words in the Muslim world, in the Darul Shifaz, as Muslims. And then suddenly you get so much water on your roots. And then after a while, you see a lot of olive tree, olive fruits and pomegranate, and you can start to enjoy them and eat them. So we need to stabilize our youths from this third culture kid as something negative and instead reimagining it and reframing it as something positive and beneficial. Because to be multicultural, I don't like the word multicultural, but to be intercultural in the globalized world is something of a benefit. Allahu Alam. Thank you so much for that. Such an important reminder that our true identity is really just Abdullah. <laughs> and um, so I guess uh, I think that has kind of answered, but I'll just I'll just re-ask it for Zanz. And so what do you do when the children are actually being bullied? You know, what is the what? Uh, yeah. So you can tell your children to be the best. But what will you do when those kids and teachers in Sweden bully them due to their culture? Yeah, that's that's an important question. What do we do with bullying generally? I mean, it's not only in Sweden. I mean, look how Muslims are now being attacked in many parts of the world. I mean, we see how our beloved brothers and sisters in Kashmir are going through a lot of tribulations in India, Muslims in India. We see it in Myanmar with Muslims in Myanmar. We say in East Turkestan with our beloved Uyghur brothers and sisters. We see it in West, of course, in North yeah. America and Europe and in many other countries. So this is beyond Sweden. So I, I just put the international frame on yeah. this. Um, bullying comes from lack of self-knowledge. The bullier is the one who is actually weaker, um, is not stronger. And perhaps as parents, we should always tell our children this, that the strength is not in those persons that bully, first and foremost. Secondly, we can always look at the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How he, did he treat the bullies of his time? You need to treat them firm, but also with compassion. Make dua for them so they can change their hearts because some of the bulliers became some of the greatest sahaba after a time. And we believe in divine decree. So we know that if you that there are some people that have been like the worst of the jahas who became the most beautiful Muslims. And this is also important when we approach hostility that we always have the spiritual connotation in mind. We should be both dunya be act activists and ukhra be activists. <laughs> and combine this. We should not accept bullying. Of course, I mean, as I mentioned, in Futuwa, they were fighting. They were working to become physical warriors as well to protect the family. Like what Imam Ghazali speaks about Qadr. Let's say I'm sitting in my home with my family, all right? And a robber is coming into my home. Shall I just go to the bathroom and not protect my family as a man? Of course, I will protect my family, right? That's to use Qadr in a very sensible and a very fitri and in a very beautiful way to protect. And as uh, Imam Ghazali rahimullah, says in the, uh, in the Alchemy of Happiness, um, he speaks about um, uh, qadab and you know, using tools sometimes to take away uh, things that are not good for you, right? To protect yourself from harm. So, so yes, sometimes we need to put a boundary. We need to, you know, as parents, not to go and hit people, by the way, I'm not promoting that, but go to speak with the teachers if it's in school and really to look at the policies and really, you know, be active in those policies. And, you know, self-defense is, is a virtue, but it's the last uh, measure we use. It's the last measure we use. We start by, you know, protection through, to, with the tongue, <laughs> by doing dawah, <laughs> by doing dua. <laughs> you know, this is the biggest, this is the biggest muscle. The yeah. tongue is what spread Islam. I know the, the Orientalist the historical notions of the Orientalist scholars and in, in particularly in West are speaking about the sword. When we speak about Ali, Abi, Ali ibn Abi Talib's sword, actually in the Futua literature, it's not about his physical sword. His sword was the spiritual sword as mentioned in Rumi's Masnabi. Rumi, rahimullah, one of our greatest poets of all time. Rumi says, and I cannot quote it because my Persian is not as 
uh, eloquent as a person who is raised in, in, in Iran or in Afghanistan or in Tajikistan. But what essentially Rumi says is, uh, he speaks about the situation where uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib uh, radiallahu anhu was fighting a warrior and the war uh, fighting an enemy and the enemy spat on his face. The enemy spat on his face. What did Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu do? Did he spit back? No, he didn't. This person was so amazed by Ali ibn Abi Talib's behavior that he became a Muslim, subhanAllah. So we need to teach this to our youths because right. bitter masculinity is not to be a pacifist. We're not pacifists. You know? We need to protect ourselves. It's not like the, uh, the, 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 the Christian notion of turning your cheek uh, on the other side. It's not the way that we deal with things. But it doesn't mean that we hit in the first. We don't hit. We use the tongue. We use our akhlaq. We will use our adab as our biggest weapon and tool. Right. And this is what spread Islam. So we need to strengthen our youths in this notion, using as Dr. Shantuk referred to when it comes to how to conceptualize uh, Futuba ethics in a narrative meaning connected to the history of the Sahaba, like Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, or the history of the Anbiya and the Prophets. You know, these are great ways of engaging the youths, but we need to be balanced. We should have protective measures. We need to know our rights, our social rights, our humanitarian rights, but we need to also know our spiritual rights, both our rights with the button, which is our inner self and how we work with that to start with there and also the outer, which is the Zahir. I hope this was of a benefit for the brother who asked Barakal questions. Fikum, of course, and, you know, I really appreciate always bringing it back to, you know, like let's look at our Prophet Sallallahu This is the month of Rabia. And, you know, there is no one who encapsulated all of, you know, how to be a noble character. And that definition of strength that you shared with us earlier is uh, restraining the anger. So, you know, and that's how the the hearts were won, subhanAllah. Barakallahu I mean, look, uh, look at Abu Sufyan, uh, radiallahu anhu. Oh. I, mean, I mean, he is an imperfect example. Even look at Wahshi. Uh, I mean... There are so many, I mean, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he went through so much difficulties and how did he treat people? I mean, Rashi killed his uncle. So, and of course we're not, the, I mean, he's in Sun Khan, but we're all filled with flaws, <laughs> but we can at least mirror ourselves. Right. With that said, it doesn't mean that we should accept bullying, of course. And there, there is ways that we can do intervention and psychology, the psychology of the bullier is the psychology of inferiority complex. And that's also something that we need to understand and discuss with our children. Right. Thank you so much. Um, okay, our next um, question is uh, from our Estad. Uh, please forgive me if I say your name wrong. Mashushi um, Salah. Uh, the concept of perfect man is popular among philosophers and mystics, but somehow is too virtual. Is it better we use the Quranic concept of Khalifa and other terms? In the Fatwa manuscript, they use also the word Khalifa as well. So yeah, of course we can use that as well. I mean, we're all Khalifa of Allah on earth. So yeah, definitely. I mean, essentially uh, the wording is something we can discuss. And there is, you know, there is a valid uh, reason why Brother Salah is speaking about this. But in the end of the day, it's about uh, what can we utilize from the concept of Fatwa in this contemporary era. Uh, that is the main, uh, main uh, goal with this whole uh, project that we will, will now uh, start to uh, enroll in, inshallah, together, inshallah. So yeah, definitely Khalifa is a great word to use. Yes, thank you. And um, another question actually from our uh, brother Amin, who uh, had previously also asked a question. So another question from him, is this physical body, male, female, just a garment which hides our true essence and beguiles us? What is our true essence? Are we male and female in essence, in re reality? Is our appearance, male or female, different from our reality or essence? Does change in... Sorry, no, no, continue. I thought the question was done. Yeah, continue. And does, I can repeat it at the end. Does change in character traits, controlling anger, shedding tears, not hiding emotions, belonging to a group, change our reality? Or our is our reality unchangeable and character traits are just a manifestation of our reality? This is Maybe a very I'll... deep question. Very yeah, deep. it is. And I it think is. that it's a question we need to ponder about for hours. Yeah. Yeah. There's not an easy answer on that. Uh, my take on some of the parts of the question, 
I mean, we're born as men and women. I mean, this is something we're born as, you know, that, right. that is our reality. Right. And it's also the fitri way of looking at it. And perhaps that's also what different, differentiate the way that we from Islamic paradigm look at these God-given, you know, identities compared to maybe other ideologies that are being normalized in many contexts today. Uh, when it comes to our, if, uh, if the things that we socialize ourselves in will change our reality, our reality will not be changed because our reality is the fitra. That is our primary reality. And don't quote me on this because I, I, I am I'm just a seeker of knowledge like all of you. So this is from my small amount of knowledge. But in my knowledge, our reality is the fitra. It is our, you know, and the fitra is our experience of, 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 you know, Allah's divine name and attributes as we have witnessed him through our, you know, soul when our soul was created, right? This witnessing through Allah subhanahu, subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine names and attributes it is imprinted uh, on our soul. Uh, and that is our fitra. And when we come into dunya, uh, we forget about this, uh, you know, witnessing, right? And uh, as we prolong in dunya, through socialization, we get detached, and we always feel this primal, primal wound uh, in ourselves subconsciously. So in dunya, as we you know grow up, we try to uh, to to project the loss of this you know primal uh, you know wound, uh, which is you know the, the the loss of the conscious awareness of uh, you know uh, our fitra uh, and in that. Uh, you know, our, our, you know, witnessing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's, subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine name is an attribute, we project this longing into mortal objects. The first uh, projection is into our first primal caregiver, which is our mother. And our mother, our, most mothers are beautiful, right? But the mother, our mother is not perfect, because perfection is only in Allah, right? I mean, we all could embody some of, uh, some, you know, uh, you know, sacred attributes, but perfection is in Allah, right? So, after a while, the child see, wait a minute, my mom is beautiful, but she's not perfect. And he or she is still longing for that, uh, that primary, you know, witnessing of perfection, right? Which is imprinted in the fitra on our soul, right? As an imprint on our soul. And then you go and project that into your father. And then after, right, into a teacher. And then you go and go. Uh, and, and that's the socialization that, you know, changes our perceived reality in dunya, but our fitra is still there. Right. And what the whole trajectory in dunya is, is to consciously, through our spiritual wafering, through our saluk, reconnect ourselves to that fitra experience, experiencing it again, but this time in a conscious way, by working with ourselves, by rectifying ourselves, by going into the spiritual wafering, into that uh, spiritual trajectory in life. To once more reconnect to that, uh, you know, station of being in that. Uh, fitraic space, but this time in a consciously way, right? Now, does that mean that we are changed as people? No, our essence is the same, right? But then all of our socialization, all of our experience in dunya gives us different ways of uh, expressing ourselves. And these are the layers that, fill, that, that blurs us from connecting with our true essence, which is our fitra, our natural disposition towards uh, tawheed and the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, Tawheed. So this is a, a, a bigger discussion than what I can answer today. So whether our essence is the same? Yes, if the, I mean, the fitra is our witnessing and we all are you know, born upon fitra, but then we also born with different character traits. Some people are, are more maybe melancholic in their ways. Some people are more perhaps sanguine in their ways. Some people are more, let's say, um, uh, introverted, extroverted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have different character traits. So this is your test. You need to work to moderate yourself. So you can be born with certain, you know, trials that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to you in order for you to come closer to him by rectifying yourself. So your test might be different than another person's test. So even though our essence is the same, but our realities could be also different because Allah puts us in different realities in dunya, gives us different character traits in dunya. So a person who has a lot of anger needs to rectify him or herself by becoming calmer. Uh, a person who is too calm needs to rectify him or herself to become a little bit more active. So this is your trajectory in life. This is your reality. But our outcome is the same. We want to come to Allah. We want to come closer to Allah. We want to please Allah, you know. And we do that through the Sunnah of the Prophet as the template of how we should perfect ourselves, how we should rectify ourselves in order to come closer to him. Barakallah. Barakallah. 
Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, let me also add Allahu Alam, by the way. This is just yeah. a, a brief reflection from my side, and I might be wrong. Alhamdulillah, wa shukur Allah. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, definitely um, questions that are getting us thinking. So thank you so much to our dear participants. Um, Brother Ibrahim, who had also previously asked a question, and Sister Zina, there's again some something similar in what they're both asking. Again, I, I think you've kind of addressed this, but I'll I'll read them out. Um, again, this is Brother Ibrahim's, how do we reach our beloved youth and makes them understand that their true identity is through Allah and the Sunnah, um, even when the gang life has them strong in its grip? And similarly, Sister Zenith is also just talking about, you know, coming up with that system of, of Futua uh, that can promote a Muslim identity, um, even when we have, you know, divisions within families and within sects of Islam. Um, and so, yeah, I guess it's, uh, I'm putting those two out kind of together. So one way is to speak according to the language and, 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 and that the youths can relate to. For instance, we need to take over TikTok and, and utilize and disseminate Futua and TikTok. Uh, we, we can do it through hip hop. I mean, I could freestyle. Like, listen, my young boy, you need to show a smile. This is how we do when we freestyle. And sometimes you go through pain and trials. This doesn't mean that you cannot flow like now. And as a matter of fact, you don't need to be a gangster because to be a gangster is actually sometimes to be a hamster. Rather, you should be a Futua and a spiritual uh, salik, so you can be abdu al malik, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty. And we can find inspiration in Malcolm X through his film made by Spike Lee. So when we freestyle, we can become a true futua. You see, sh chivalry, not good word, rather noble character, a lot of flatter, humbleness, servitude, gratitude, not being rude not to be racist towards other people, but to see through, not to be a haiwan, not to listen to the west-west from shaitan, rather to be a man uh, and a veteran where you combine zahir with batin so we can do it together and not just kick people in the bottom of the society so we can bring a different reality and we shouldn't be a mercenary for money. We should go in Allah's path because that's what will make you humble, you see. And look at the prophetic behavior, adab and tarbiya. We need to do uh, uh, tahliya and tahliya and we need to engage in beautiful tarbiya. And this is what we do when we have a vasila through our rule, we will connect to Allah's um, uh, and inspired by his divine, divine names and attributes. So understand me in Futua, it's all about being noble in your character and have gratitude towards your brothers and sisters and not to just be a, solidify yourself as the leader or a mister because the Amir, a leader should be with his people, organize them, socialize them and see through. And that what the Futua Guild have in their association. So we need to share Futua for all nations. So you could freestyle for the youths. And when you freestyle, they will understand the message according to the way that they relate to things. And that's how the traditional Futuas did. They had poets making these acronyms, like uh, what Dr. Shemturk alluded to in Al Sulami's uh, manuscript of Futua. They used acronyms to engage and disseminate their virtues in a, in a pedagogical way. They used poetry, right? And we can use the modern tools that youths relate to in order for them to engage in this virtues uh, behaviors inshallah so that was just one example we can do it in many other ways inshallah uh, uh, mashallah, uh, i think we've been graced uh, to see um some of jamal Adin's just uh talents you know he just spins that just like that so alhamdulillah uh and we really hope that inshallah you will continue and 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 to build that uh fatua and and she the academy inshallah with uh, everybody's help inshallah and the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, okay, I think I'm going to ask this last question. We're we're quite a bit over time, and we thank everyone who That's is... That's my fault, uh, actually. I'm so sorry. I, I oh, let no. you all the time. <laughs> it's engaging, mashallah. So alhamdulillah. And we thank everyone who is here. And please, um, we apologize for our shortcomings in, in going over. But we hope that, inshallah, everyone is benefiting. So I'll ask the last, um, so the last kind of question that I said, you know, just again, with families being divided and coming up that, you know, building that Muslim identity, you know, that's 
beyond sects or beyond, um, you know, divisions. Um, I think you've kind of spoken to that before in one of the previous uh, questions as well, just building up our identity as based on the Quran and Sunnah, and then of course, allowing that. Um, but if you, if there's anything you wanted to add there, otherwise I can ask the last question. How to unite people? I mean, part of I can, the- Yeah, so I'll, I'll read it. Um, I can be wrong, but in the West, one can still come together as Muslims, but here in India, so the person, Zenith is from India, we have sex every few kilometers. We'll see a new community, a community with their version of Islam. Local scholars criticize the other, promoting certain beliefs and bidda and adamant on declaring each other as non-Muslims. How do we come up of, with a system of fatua which could promote this Muslim identity and in this kind of society? Even families are divided in sex. So this is a very important question, honestly. And this is one of our biggest tests in life, right? Because it's so easy to go into different sects. First and foremost, everything needs to be rooted in the primary resources of Islam, the Quran, and the Sunnah. But as we were referring to earlier, there is a multiplexity, which is something that is like, you can see that, like in the Ottoman Empire, uh, they had like different courts for different madahibs, you know, that was the case. And even the non-Muslims had their own courts of law. This is the multiplexity. But when you have a society that is rooted in Tawheed, in our primary sources, then it's easy to have multiplexity. The problem in our societies today, we're not rooted in, our societies are not fitri. And when you're living in non-fitri societies, then easily you can go astray and create, you know, fitna, uh, unnecessary fitna and divisions that are not, you know, according to how we should you know, connect and reconnect with one another. Uh, and then also, when we have a stable identity, then we can also accept adab al ikhtilaf There will always be ikhtilaf. I mean, it's for sure. And you know, look at the traditional scholars. I mean, even if Imam Ghazali rebuttaled Ibn Sina, he didn't say that Ibn Sina, uh, all of his work is bad. <laughs> he didn't say that. He was criticizing some of his notions and philosophy, right? So, and that's a valid criticism, right? We can criticize and we can give feedback, but do it in an academical way. Do it with adab al ikhtilaf Respect your component. Doesn't need you need to accept your opponent. Respect and accept it is two different things, right? I don't need to accept your thoughts. Maybe I don't. I have a different view, but I can respect you as a human, you know, and that you have your struggle, and I will make dua for you. You shouldn't always convey all things to all people either. You know, sometimes you need to know when to convey messages and do it in a humble way. You should give nasiya to your brother, if you're a brother. But how are you giving that nasiya? Are you doing that by doing takfir on him? Or are you doing it by conveying it in a humble way? Because we need feedback. I appreciate feedback because I grow from feedback. I'm not, I have a lot to learn from all of you, dear brothers and sisters. I'm so honored that you guys are here 30 minutes after the lecture. Please forgive me for any shortcomings. Just for you guys to share out of your precious time. It's an honor for me. I learn from all of you. So if we convey our message, we need to do it with adab, with akhlaq. How did the Prophet wasallam rectify some of the Sahaba when they did a mistake? Or some people that, that were not yet his followers that became his followers. He rectified them with ihsan. What does the Hadith Jibreel say to us? Iman, Islam, ihsan, right? So what happened with ihsan? We need to have ihsan in our ways of communicating with one another. We all need to have husnudan. Like there's so many hadith that says how the Prophet Sallallahu engaged with people who were doing the most awful things, right? And how did he rectify them? Did he say, throw him out of here? He went and he was like even serving them, subhanAllah. Yeah. This is the beauty of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we need to try to embody that. And that's why adab al-ikhtilaf was a practice among scholars traditionally, you know? To have adab while you still engage in ikhtilaf, we can have ikhtilaf. That's the multiplexity. But we are all, at least most of us, uh, agree that the sunnah and the Quran is where we root ourselves. That's tawheed, that's the, our, our stable foundation, right? At least as Sunni Muslims. Now, when it comes to fitna, when it comes to division, it's like this is also to do with psychology. In societies, which there is a lot of tensions, where there's a lot of struggles, where there's a lot of turmoil, you find more divisions. Because one thing that uh, people that are oppressed do sometimes, they channelize the oppression by throwing it to other oppressed people instead of attacking the system that is oppressing them. That's why minorities are fighting in minorities because the majority system to still keep the power in hand, the modern Firaun, all right? In order for the modern Firaun, to keep power in hand, 
the modern fira will put the problems between minorities. You should fight this person and this person, instead of uniting each other against a system which in itself is more problematic than the ikhtalaf that we could have, perhaps if we are adhering to different madhab. You know, I'm just saying that as an example. So we need to unite on the common denominators. We need to give nasiha according to husnadan and with good adab. We need to disagree when we need to disagree, but do it with adab. Well, and, and these are all components that we can learn from our Islamic tradition. So all these divisions are, in a sense, a way for Allah to make us come closer to him by rectifying us, by, by, by making us, uh, you know, uh, going into Tasqid al-Nafs and how we're engaging with others. Not throwing people under the bus because people can always grow and learn, you know, people can always change, you know. And we have that uh, in, in the, in, in, in the, in the seerah of many of the Sahaba who, in the, their time in Jahiliyyah, we never thought they could become one of one of the most beautiful people that ever walked on, 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 on dunya. So just to finalize, sectarian mentality, uh, to understand it so, sociologically is due to many reasons. You find it more sectarianism in, 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 in context where there is a lot of turmoil, a lot of social instability. So uh, one way to break uh, these type of um, uh, you know, uh, sectaristic ways is to bring more prosperity, creating community, creating sohbah, uh, when people have access to education, access to healthcare, access to sound life, then I'm sure you will let, you will be less deviant in your ways. Uh, 100%, uh, Allah alam, I should never say 100% because Allah knows best, but I, I'm, I'm a strong believer in this. So let's say 90%. <laughs> and in the end, it's also about nafs. It's your nafs that says, I am right and you are wrong. But there is always wisdom in everything. Like why did the prophet say that the wisdom is the last property of the believer? Wisdom we can find everywhere, even in a person that might be wrong in many things, maybe some things we can learn from that person, right? Doesn't mean that we should normalize their mentality, their ideologies, things that are not according to Islamic paradigm, we should refrain from. This is very important to your brothers and sisters, but have in mind multiplexity, Unity comes in Tawheed and in the Quran and Sunnah. Multiplexity comes in sometimes how do we interpret things, right? That's the multiplexity. That's also uh, something that we should engage in and with the adab al ikhtilaf. And finally, another thing that is very important when it comes to this question is with regards to um, um, particularly the sisters from India. I don't want to just speak about India because I'm not from India, so I'm not an expert of India, but it's about what unites us. We need to look at the common denominator because we have more unite. We have more things in common than not in common. Sometimes I'm a little bit like uh, interested in understanding. Maybe this has to do with inferiority complex. Sometimes we rather engage with non-Muslims than with Muslims that might have some notions that are different than ours, uh, that our own self. Like mine might be different than yours. But then why are we engaging with non-Muslims that are, that are even more different than us? You know, they don't even believe in Tawheed. They don't believe in the Prophet as the last messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is also something that we can think about. But when we are rooted in our stable foundation, which is the Quran and the Sunnah, um, we can then have multiplicity. Why do we say Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah? You know, the majority. So we always look at the majority, where are that? That's the way that Ahlul Sunnah has always approached all aspects of ikhtilaf. Where is the majority thought? You know, where is the middle thought? Where is the moderation thought? Uh, so this is very important, but it needs to be rooted in the Quran and the Sunnah, and also the way that we engage in this. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take away all of this, uh, all of this fitna in the ummah. And I think that the day when we are united again, that's when we can prosper again. And inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will find that avenue for us, inshallah. Ameen. Barakallahu fikum. I think that's a beautiful, actually, uh, dua to, to, to end on. And... Um, Thank you so much to everyone, to Jamal Adin, alhamdulillah, wa shukrullah. Thank you for uh, inspiring us and for sharing this and for uh, hopefully uh, getting us all uh, reconnected with uh, ways that we can connect with the true identity, which is being Abdullah and true definitions of strength and uh, of noble character. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless everyone who's here. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much to Brother Muhammad Nidal. Mm -hmm. um for for helping and assisting and all of the team uh who helped put this together as sister nadira and all the admins on that team as well um we hope that inshallah that you can take a moment to fill in the um, feedback form 
Uh, it really does help us. And um, with that, inshallah, say Jamaluddin, if you would like to end with the closing dua. Inshallah. I just want to thank all uh, Sister Fatima, Sister Brother Nidal for your amazing work, Sister Ismat, Sister Nadira, and all of our colleagues. You're all doing an amazing job. Barakallahu fikum. Thank you for all of you joining. Please forgive me for any shortcomings and everything I said. If I said anything wrong, uh, please make dua for me to, so that I can learn more and grow more uh, as your brother and as a Muslim and as a seeker of knowledge. We're all Talib al-ilm and we're all seekers of knowledge. So we're learning from our beautiful tradition. For two, I something very beautiful. I encourage all of you to join our groups, inshallah, both the brother groups for brothers and the general group for both brothers and sisters, because this is a beautiful part of our tradition. We have had the blessing of many of the leading scholars in the field that are supporting our initiative. So we have with us Sheikh Dawood Walid, Dr. Shem Turk, Dr. Samir Mahmoud, and many other excellent scholars that are supporting our Dr. Rothman, Dr. Keshavarzi, some of my own mentors and teachers. So they are very much excited of what we want to do with this Fatua Network and Academy, inshallah. So feel free to join and we will inform more in all of our you know, social media platforms. And finally, Fatua is a way of bringing unification and unity amongst Muslims all over the world by focusing on the noble character traits of being virtuous and take away all the vices. And that's the way of breaking fitna is to add virtues and take away vices. Vices of envy creates fitna. Vices of hasad creates witna. Virtues of, uh, of listening, uh, of sama creates uh, you know, dialogue uh, and to be curious of each other and to have husna done for your brother and sister and to, to always make dua for even your enemies, even though sometimes you need to protect yourself. Look what Ali ibn Abi Talib uh, anhu, did. He brought a, 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 a person who was a non-believer into the deen of Islam by his character. So our character is our greatest tool for changing hearts and changing minds. And at the end of the day, we're not changing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who changes. We're just tools of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're just vessels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's make a dua together, inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all uh, great tools of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all vessels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us vessels where we can rectify ourselves first and foremost before we rectify others. Where we I mean, work with our jihad al nafs before we, we, we work with jihad al dunya. Mm -hmm. We work with our own naps and our soul self-struggle and don't judge other people's because of their shortcomings because rest assured that you also have a lot of shortcomings in yourself. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala restate our beautiful tradition of futuwa, of akhlaq, of tarbiyah, our beautiful tradition of, uh, of uh, noble character traits, of supporting each other, of helping musafirs, of establishing guilds where our youths can become men and women through a holistic approach where young boys can get the respect they deserve and not to be criminalized or stigmatized by a society which judges them because of their religion, culture, or, uh, or, uh, or, or color of their skin or race or ethnicity. We Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow all of our young brothers and men who are in destructive uh, uh, circles to come back to a fitri mm -hmm. circle. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to invite them back to the fitri circle, to mm -hmm. not judge the sinner, rather judge the sin. To not judge the sinner, rather judge the sin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring all of our brothers who are now facing struggles and perhaps are not in a good state of health and are in destructive uh, networks, give them an avenue through futuwa to come into the, uh, to the path of deen al-haqq and to the sirat al mustaqim and mm -hmm. to Futua and let us all internalize. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for all sisters, our mm -hmm. mothers, our, our brothers, our fathers, all of those who lost their relatives due to uh, bad actions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, rectify all of us and create uh, and establish the community according to the teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Al-Fatiha. Thank you so much, everyone. I wish you all a great day and 